I've been sent two Nightcore tubes, dead Nightcore tubes, by a chap called Marcus. And he said the first one, the blue one, went through the washing machine with his car keys. Fortunately, the car keys survived, but the blue tube didn't. The pinky ready one, it uh, just stopped working. Now, I have a sneaky feeling that this is the same thing that happened to my brothers. I gave my brother one of these recently, and he brought it over and said it had stopped working. It turns out that the Nikkor tube has a fairly undocumented feature. It does actually have a lockout function. So these aren't operating. Let's try and unlock them. So I'm going to press both of them and hold the button in for a long period of time and see if they come back to action. This one's come back to life. This one has not. This one is dead. OK, so let me show you the lockout function in these because this one is now probably fully operational, yep. Let me show you how the oper lockout operation is locked and unlocked. So if the light's on, you have to do it with the light on. While it's on, press and hold the button until it flashes. Takes a modest length of time and that's it locked out. Very easy to do in your pocket. To unlock it, just simply hold the button to three, four, five, about four or five seconds and that's it unlocked. So sorry, Marcus, it was locked out in your pocket. This one, though, is a different story. I think we have to go into this one and see what's happened internally. I know that these uh, screws require the very sharp screwdriver tip, so I've got this Kamasa screwdriver bit out. So let's uh, just go up a little bit closer without going in too far, and we'll open this up and see what's inside. That may be the problem. When put on charge, it didn't really seem to like end its charge well. I'm not sure if current's going into the battery at all. It may be there's corrosion in the circuit board. Is that screw going to... I think that screw may be stripped. I may have to stop it and drill that one out if it is. Or it may just be spinning. In hindsight, I should have just given these a touch with a soldier iron. Someone else mentioned when you get the screws that jam into the plastic, if they're the tapping screws, then just touching them with the tip of a pointy soldier iron is enough to soften the plastic that they'll usually come out. Quite often, though, uh, you take these screws out and the where they've cut into the plastic, if the machine that's put them in has been, uh, or the person operating a power tool to put them in, has been overzealous, the screws uh, will actually have chewed into the plastic. They'll have dug themselves a hole and not really come in doubt anymore. Not a huge fan of overzealous use of electric screwdrivers for that reason. I've worked with people in the past who used cordless screwdrivers for everything, but uh, just really had no subtlety. They would just bludgeon the screws in with such force, I'm going to have to drill that out, that it would basically, the screw would go in, it was never ever coming out again, it would damage the panel it was put in. I'm going to pause momentarily, I'm going to take that screw out. And rather predictably, there are significant signs of corrosion. Uh, it turned out there were two major points of corrosion in this, because I have fixed it. Uh, one of the faults was relatively easy to find, the other was really not easy to find. So, Initially, I gave these circuit boards a clean. I used a toothbrush that I keep for cleaning the circuit boards with methylated spirits. I'd prefer isopropyl alcohol, but it's quite hard to get over here because uh, shipping it over uh, requires a sort of hazmat shipping because of the fire risk. The battery protection circuit board has the DW01 and the 8205 double MOSFET system that's used to protect the cell from over discharge or overcharge, but the voltage was down to about 2.5 volts, which is, to be fair, the cutoff point. No charge was going to this. Even when it was powered up, the blue LED was lighting here, and it was going through the motions of charging it, but it wasn't charging at all. And it turned out that on the other side, up around about this area here, there was a corroded pad. The pad is in the vicinity of the negative rail, that's the positive rail, and it had just totally corroded away. This picture's a wee bit fuzzy because it really was. I, I couldn't focus on such a small object. It was quite... It, the, keep in mind that this is fairly tiny in real life. So I put a bit of wire and bridged across that after scrubbing the copper clean. But after I'd done that, the voltage it trickle charged, as these chips do. This is the generic... Um, LTC40540 type thing. It's, it goes under various names, but it's the generic sort of pinout of this chip that initially, if it detects the voltage is too low, it will try and recover it at a slow trickle charge before it kicks into full charge. So it did that. It started charging about 10 milliamps before kicking up to 100 milliamps once this was above about 3 volts. After that, 
um, the unit was very intermittent. I just couldn't get it to operate at all. The When I pushed the button, uh, it just didn't, re didn't really respond too well to the button, but the light was flicking on and off itself. It turned out, after an awful lot of investigation, and it, it really, I had to trace all the connections to this chip, for instance. Uh, this pin here, in the, this, this little microcontroller, is used to uh, detect the button being pressed. Uh, this one is one of the power rails. This one is driving the transistor to switch the LED on. But what was actually happening, and it's again, it's so small you can hardly see it. Down here, corrosion had occurred between this pad, which is the uh, low current switch signal to the processor via this pad track here, uh, and the negative rail, which it's referenced to. And because it had been corroding in there, uh, that bridged out, but I didn't notice that at first. I actually thought the switch might have been faulty, and uh, I desoldered the switch and removed it. And then I spotted the big patch of corrosion under there, scrubbed it all away, checked the switch, the switch was fine, soldered the switch back in, and that's what actually ended up fixing the fault. So, um, yes, typical corrosion faults. They're very hard to trace at times, particularly on a fairly cluttered circuit board like this with lots of plated through holes jumping backwards and forwards. But um, it's fixed. I will say that uh, when you put something into a washing machine, one of the biggest killers in that for electronic stuff is the detergent. Bleach, detergent, whatever, as soon as that machine starts filling up, your equipment is getting totally deluged with conductive liquid. And at that point, you'll get the corrosion starting to occur because of the DC um, current flow um, causing this sort of electrolytic action of eating away the metal. This had uh, suffered a modest amount of corrosion because it was wrapped in tape. The lithium cells have the sort of that circuit board fold over onto them, then wrapped in tape that way and then folded over the end. And the, because of that, it trapped water in, so it uh, suffered a lot more corrosion than the others. But not, not to the best of my knowledge, catastrophic corrosion. All the tracks and pads looked to be there okay. But actually, you don't really know that uh, until you actually do a full test of whether it overcharges um, or, well, over-discharges. In this case, I know it didn't over-discharge. It stopped when it should have at around about 2.5 volts. So that was an interesting, but I have to say, very time-consuming thing. It took really lots of probing about in this to discover that little patch of corrosion in there that you wouldn't really, it wasn't really obvious. It was very hidden. It was just tucked right under the switch. And it's where the water had just sat underneath there and just eaten away continually because even if you took the thing out after, from the washing machine and tried to dry it out, wherever water was trapped, that corrosion would just keep going until uh, everything sort of, sort of the water is just basically finely evaporated out and it will leave that conductive trace after that. But yeah, that was quite an interesting little thing to do. And uh, yeah, so this one was the rogue lockout and this one was, yeah, definitely corrosion damage.